Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our presentation called Climbing the Pack Offense. My name is Robert Bogart. I have uh, 15 years of security and uh, systems engineering experience in the industry. I've been at Indeed for a year and a half. Um, I'm involved with currently helping with uh, network access control and endpoint protection. I consider myself a jack of all trades with various interests involving anything to do with computer technology. I'm <laughs> Dale Whitaker Lewis, 25 years, uh, well, four years at Indeed so far, a little over 25 years in security engineering, network engineering, and software development, and Fortune 50 enterprise startup in mid size IT, and mostly interested in infrastructure security and with an adversary focus. Indeed, where we come from, number one job site on the, inter on the internet, 200 million unique visitors per month. Uh, we've got 60 countries, about 28 languages, so quite a, quite a global reach. Uh, we have, at Indeed, internally, our global workforce is rapidly growing. We've got new, frequently have new or expanded offices, relocated employees. Um, we've got a variety of non-employees who do work on our facilities, so that increases the need for figuring out some sort of secure access to our office networks. Today we'll be talking about NAC, uh, which is Network Access Control. Uh, we'll be implementing NAC with network authentication through the IEEE 8021X standard. Uh, the software package that we use is called Packet Fence. It's developed and maintained by Inverse, who is a software consultant company based out of Montreal, Quebec. 8021X is complex and has strict requirements. We're going to try to help you make an informed decision about how to implement NAC. Uh, the main reason for NAC is increased security and uh, greater control over your network. I do want to take a second to talk about two terms, NAC, Network Access Control, and NACL, which is Network Access Control List. Uh, NAC is talking about people accessing your network, and NACL is actually um, permissions on the uh, router, the switch, or the VLAN. Uh, first up, project goals. These are in no particular order. Um, our first uh, goal was to have 100% coverage from wired and wireless uh, access. Uh, the only thing that is not covered in that is actually our guest network, which is WPA2. Um, another goal was role-based, uh, role-based, uh, role-based and automated network segmentation. Uh, we wanted no human intervention required for our users to log into the network. Uh, that, that's, that's account access, not really account provisioning. That is still a, 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 a different process. Um, we also wanted to be able to find missing data from a single piece of data. Um, for us, what's important is to have the IP address and the MAC address and the user ID uh, associated with any uh, network packet. We also wanted to block suspicious devices uh, that would fail a health check or some kind of a posture assessment check. And we also wanted to uh, minimize costs as much as possible. So we uh, started our evaluation process in 2014, late 2014, so quite a while back. And it's been a, a pretty lengthy uh, evaluation and implementation life cycle. We looked at, uh, starting in late 2014, we researched and evaluated commercial network access control solutions, both non-802.1x out-of-band solutions and 802.1x authentication-based solutions. Uh, an example of a non-802.1x solution was Cisco's confusingly named NAC, uh, a network admission control. We discarded it for, and a number of others, for poor MAC support. We're a 90% MAC shop. Um, and we did an evaluation of commercial products, and then, as we'll talk about later, starting in mid-2015, we shifted our focus to an open source solution, which was Packet Fence. Um, that helped us uh, out of a jam. Uh, after losing momentum, the quick eval setup time uh, with open source helped us regain momentum on the project. Let's have a look at uh, the features of the two main categories of options, which led to our product decision. So in the commercial option, uh, we, the vendor we were looking at and working extensively with on a evaluation proof of concept and pilot uh, was a commercial NAC vendor and their business model was focused around licensing, per user licensing and of course add-on feature licensing. So we spent a lot of, quite a bit of time uh, getting, just getting ramped up, getting the licensing set up, spending time worrying about, you know, how many users are we going to have in the pilot versus what technology uh, we're applying to network access control. The, uh, another 
thing that challenged the evaluation process was that we were making, as, as you often do, network technology transitions in the middle of uh, trying to evaluate this. We were moving from one switching vendor hardware platform to another, and that new platform was not supported with the commercial vendor's product. So we ran into delays with supporting that, and, and it made it very difficult to do, at least on the wired network, to do an evaluation. Uh, they were, again, because of the business model, there were efforts to upsell us on less critical features when just as the process of, in the process of trying to get the basic functionality working. When we started to transition in the evaluation, at the, at the beginning of the process, we had looked at both commercial and uh, open source solutions, and at the beginning of the process, there were very few open source options in the network admission control, or sorry, there we go, network access control space. That's why we went with a commercial uh, off-the-shelf solution initially. But during the course of our struggles, the, uh, the open source options caught up and reached near feature parity by the end of our proof of concept of the commercial product. And that's because they're extensible and fixable uh, by a community. For open source options, uh, in our evaluation, we found that there was either flexible or non-existent licensing. Um, and, uh, and that paid support was either non-existent, which can be a downside, or just based on a support contract rather than a license. So final, our final selection, uh, settling on the tech technology is no probably big surprise here based on what I've said. The rapid procurement and installation of, uh, of the open source option, the, it was a bottom-up process, so the engineers could test functionality, do full proof of concept and full pilot without really ever involving anybody in procurement or anywhere up the chain where that might have slowed down that process. It ran on commodity systems, open source products generally do. Uh, you grab a server or VM uh, running Linux, you can get your project going very quickly. Uh, one option that's interesting in this vendor uh, in particular is a, a black box uh, virtual appliance, just an ISO you download, and for small and medium businesses, uh, you could have a working NAC solution, theoretically, although I didn't, we didn't go this route theoretically have a working NAC solution by just downloading and doing a little configuration on an ISO. Finally, their freemium model, uh, it's been adopted by a lot of open source based vendors, means that whatever money you do end up spending is, is targeted on support. You, you, you're not worrying about licensing and worrying about headcount growth, which for, indeed was a big uh, issue. Now we'll uh, talk a bit about the NAC environment. Like, uh, like most things, the, the adage, measure twice, cut once, really comes in handy. Uh, the last thing you want to do is, is shift stride in the middle of a project or, or change products or anything like that. Uh, another, another thing to keep in mind is what is your long-term support going to look like? Who on your team is going to be managing uh, the NAC service? Are there any third-party vendors? Are they going to be around in two years? Um, there's, there's lots of uh, long-term thought that goes into that. Another uh, consideration is changes in your environment. Uh, what happens when you double in size? What happens when you move locations or anything like that? Uh, another consideration is emergencies. What do you do in an emergency? What happens if uh, your employees can't get on the Wi-Fi to, to, to do their work? Um, another consideration is uh, how to scale out. What happens if you do double in size? How are you gonna have enough hardware uh, systems in place to, to handle that. Um, for this, you want to consider whether you want to go virtualized or uh, bare metal. Uh, Zitrix Send Server or VMware are, are great choices. They're easy to spin up new, as our new test servers. Uh, for us, bare metal was a, was a hassle because we have a long uh, uh, request process or provisioning process. Um, you want to think about whether you want to have it clustered or standalone. Um, it all comes down to how much high availability you want, how much load balancing you want. You also want to consider MySQL backend. Uh, you, you are required to have a, a relational database uh, for PackOffense to work. Do you want that to be local to the PackOffense uh, server or do you want it to be a remote instance? 
you also want to think about uh, what, what kind of configuration management do you want. Uh, Hand-rolling hand uh, packet fence servers can be very tedious and, and uh, error-prone, so you really want something uh, to make sure that everything is configured correctly. Now, at, now at Indeed, uh, we chose to go with Zen Server, so we have multiple Zen servers uh, running version 7 and above, uh, and we also standardized on the, the free uh, CentOS 6.5 and, and 7. You also, uh, or we also decided to go with uh, the, the clustered version. Uh, we use HAProxy and KeepAlive. Uh, KeepAlive uses virtual router redundancy protocol, VERP, uh, to move a, a, product, or a clustered IP back and forth between the two packet fence servers. And we use HAProxy to proxy the request from the VERP IP to the actual uh, active node. Um, we went, ahead, we went ahead and went with a, a local instance to the packet fence server, and then we use uh, active passive replication to keep the two databases in, in line. And we also use uh, Foreman and Puppet to automate the deployment as well as uh, control the configuration. And it's really nice because when we have to make a, a config change to 22 packet fence installations, you make it once in Puppet, Puppet pushes out all the changes. So uh, the foundation of RNAC deployment, and, and I think at this point, most of the, the wired and wireless network access control technology implementations is the IEEE standard 802.1x authentication. Uh, in the wireless uh, area, that's known as WPA2 Enterprise. Of course, it has some other features to it, but underneath WPA2 Enterprise is the 802.1x authentication process. And then on t uh, the other foundational piece is role-based access control based on group membership from a directory so that the, the directory that the user is provisioned into through whatever HR process or management process equals the access that they get on the network. So since it's at the heart of this, it's going to be, I think, worth going through for those who do or don't remember uh, 802.1x, quickly how that works. Um, it's got its own sort of terminology. It's kind of sucks that it, they kind of make up their, you know, we, we know it as the client, they know it as the supplicant. So uh, when <laughs> we have the client that's trying to get on the network, the thing it's trying to connect to, the networking equipment, which is a switcher controller known as an authenticator, the packet fence NAC server that's responsible for mediating the authentication and uh, role-based access control process, the authentication server, it's got free radius uh, built into it. And then that's backed by the directory server. In our case, uh, the open source implementation of Active Directory Samba, Samba, the version 4. All of that is to me mediate access to some sort of internal network resource or, and or access to the internet. So quickly, client tries to get on the network, uh, either by associating with a Wi-Fi network or plugging into a port on the switch. The switch demands the identification of the client. Client gives, uh, and this is through the uh, extensible authentication protocol, or EAP, which is part and parcel of uh, 802.1x. Uh, the client gives the username, and in our case, a password hash back to the switch. The switch uh, facilitates a TLS tunnel setup between, via the EAP protocol uh, from the client to the packet fence server. And now, actually, it's, it's connecting to the embedded free radius server within the packet fence server. All that to check, to securely pass that hash and check the ID. Packet fence uh, talks to Samba on the back end, passes the hash and verifies the ID, and at the same time retrieves via LDAP the, the group membership of the client. Uh, assuming that all worked out, your password was okay, it sends the switch and accept packet via radius and appends onto that the radius option 81 which tells the switch what VLAN the client is supposed to end up on. And then that gets, the success packet gets passed back to the client. Now, uh, one wrinkle in this that is part of the network access control workflow, if you will, is that if the client MAC has not been seen ever before by the NAC system, you go through a registration process. And the way that works is that instead of handing back the VLAN that's appropriate for your job role, you're given, the switch is told to put you on a registration VLAN. It then uses, uh, a, 
then uses a DNS-based redirection captive portal, like we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while, like you'd see at an airport Wi-Fi hotspot, to uh, isolate the client until they, they register their device via that portal. Um, once they've done the registration, then uh, it uses that same process to reassociate the client to their appropriate, the uh, VLAN appropriate for their role. <laughs> so uh, with uh, PacketFence as the RADIUS server, unregistered devices are diverted using RADIUS option 81 to a registration VLAN. Uh, once the user accepts the uh, AUP, uh, RADIUS, then a RADIUS change of authority uh, packet will be sent as well. And that actually puts them from the registration VLAN to the correct VLAN. So here's an example of what someone at Indeed would see. Um, that's what it currently looks like. Uh, no information is required except for the uh, accepting the, the AUP. And everybody reads through every bit of that before checking Every single the box, time. Yeah. Every time. So, uh, Next, after they hit accept, this is basically, you can see where it says enabling access. Um, if you read really closely, you can actually see what group in VLAN uh, they were assigned. There's also a 90 second wait built into this to give the COA packet enough time to reach the switch and to actually facilitate the, the switching of VLANs with the uh, associated ARP update and all that stuff. It usually takes 30 seconds, but we made it 90 seconds. But fun fact, Mac OS X takes 90 seconds. Yeah. All right, uh, now onto the actual deployment of packet fence. All right, so we... <laughs> We uh, had a pretty rapid, well, it feels like to me, even though it, it was planned was 18 months, a pretty rapid plan for our rollout of this in two phases. We, uh, we were growing and still are growing rapidly during the deployment. We started with the plan to deploy this to 20, 24 offices in 18 months. Those offices ranged in size from about 30 people to over 1,000 by the end of the deployment. <coughs> We, as we were going along, we wanted to try to automate any portions of the process we could uh, end up, as we said, via puppet puppetization, if that's a word, of the process. And that let us do rapid provisioning and smooth up version upgrades uh, in the in cycle. We grew from about 2,000 employees to around 6,000 in the course of the deployment. Phase one of the deployment, and this is where the really the lessons learned here begin, was that we planned to roll this out. The, the big question was, how do you do this without disrupting the users and making them hate this and then getting it pulled out? We decided to follow in the network team's footsteps and deploy this whenever there was a relocation or a new office opening at any facility. Now, we're lucky because we're growing so fast that we pretty much relocated every, nearly every office uh, during the course of this. We had a green field, a new building meant a new network design and new gear. We had a green field for the network, uh, a new network de uh, design with a new IP addressing screen scheme. In many places, we were moving from unmanaged, like, you know, stuff you could get at Best Buy to, to manage switches, and uh, that helped, made possible DUNAC. We had new VLANs and a subnet design on day one. We were in the older offices, we were transitioning from Cisco LAN and Cisco Wireless LAN, and then in the new regime, we had Brocade, ICX, and AirHive Wireless. VoIP was done by Shortel. So the very first deployment was in January 2016 at our tech headquarters, which was a sort of a big bang for us to pick the, the most largest, our, the lar largest technical office to do this in. We were relocating. We had about 5,000 users then. We've grown to around or just above 1,000 users now. For the, the second phase, when we uh, circled back and tried to get all the, the offices that hadn't moved yet, we basically uh, followed the real estate team. Uh, we wanted to know what their plans were for any renovation work, or uh, we also wanted to know the network team's uh, plans to uh, renovate or uh, retrofit any any equipment they had in these offices. Um, basically, uh, we used any service interruption excuse possible to go ahead and uh, get, get a NAC in, in implemented. Um, also, when we circled back, we were able to uh, enable a feature of the Palo Alto firewalls. Um, there's an XML API that we could integrate with PacketFence that uses a user ID feature um, 
to extend the role-based permissions control to internet and WAN access uh, through the NACLs, not just the generic VLAN ACL, but we had per user uh, ACLs. Um, the progress uh, as of mid-October is we're in 22 offices. Um, technically, we are gonna be in 24 by the end of the year, uh, 25. Um, we have uh, 6,000 registered users in packet fence currently. We have 20,000 devices registered. Uh, this, this includes iPads, uh, VoIP phones, printers, and other uh, non-8021X uh, uh, capable uh, devices. Um, we have 9,800 laptops and, and workstations. Uh, these are Linux, Windows, and Mac. Uh, all these are DHCP fingerprinted and registered devices. Uh, each user averages about three devices with us. So, on to the painful lessons. Let's see. Um, 802.1x presents unique challenges since all parts of the system must agree on an EAP method to perform the authentication. Uh, Indeed has a mixed client environment, primarily Mac, some Linux, a few Windows, and lots of iOS and Android. Uh, one EAP method that supported all of our major OSs was EAP peep MS chat v2. Um, there is an, uh, uh, an alternative solution called uh, EAP TLS, but that is a very uh, um, effort intensive uh, deployment process to get a certificate on every device, uh, especially people that don't have to, uh, we have a, a BYO, uh, BYOD uh, policy where people can bring their own devices and to enforce certificates on devices that people bring in is, is extremely challenging. Um, there's also uh, another complication for us is that we use the non-Microsoft uh, implementation of AD, which is Samba. Um, also, uh, let, me, yeah, let me make this small. That works. Uh, another th uh, lesson that we learned is that the authentication layer is critical to success. Uh, if Samba or your domain controller uh, is unavailable, NAC just won't work. Um, this could be due to replication issues, it could be due to uh, virtual machine or hardware issues. It, uh, one particular problem we had was in the beginning, uh, we had packet fence servers that were trying to authenticate to domain controllers that were located uh, in, in remote uh, offices. Um, once we uh, standardized that so that they only uh, authenticated locally, that solved a lot of our latency problems. Uh, another uh, issue is uh, your network gear. The configs that you're running and the code that you're running are, are indeed factors. Uh, things like radius secrets have to be synchronized. Uh, radius timeouts are sensitive. Uh, having too short of a timeout will lead to uh, random auth errors. And uh, definitely uh, firmware versions came into uh, effect as well. You wanna make sure you're running the same firmware version and that firmware version is uh, actually working with packet fence. Um, some also, uh, some other painful lessons we had was that there's no payoff for the user. It's just one more hoop for them to run, to jump through. So they sometimes don't see the benefit of it. We obviously uh, did, it was, uh, it was in our project goals to, to be 100% covered, but the users just don't care. They just wanna get on and, and do their work. For the, uh, you, we, you, we, make we, it, you make it as, as painless as possible. Yeah. So, and, and they really only have one extra step uh, if they're Wi-Fi users, which is to, to go periodically go through that uh, registration process. Yeah. And I think we're on a like a three to six months. I don't even remember what we dialed it to recently. So they don't have to do, and we're even looking at an inactivity based re-registration re just so they, if they stay active, they don't have to register because we know them. So. Yeah. Uh, another, another lesson that we learned is that the, uh, the DNS based captive portal uh, only works uh, for some of the time or it's not guaranteed to work uh, because people have statically assigned DNS. Um, they don't pick up the DACP uh, DNS uh, settings and they just don't see the captive portal. Um, Linux is especially bad. Uh, for whatever reason, all of our Linux machines, uh, the users just never think to open a browser and get to the registration portal. Um, another, uh, another lesson we learned was posture assessment is hard. 
Uh, there are open standards for checking posture during authentication. Uh, they never really caught on with us. Uh, mainly, uh, there's a Microsoft Statement of Health and there's a Trusted Network Connect uh, standard. Uh, since we don't really run Windows, we're, most, we're mainly a, a Mac shop. Uh, it just never really got implemented uh, correctly. Uh, we also learned that uh, that uh, that uh, Pekafence is written in Perl, and there's no real API to do posture assessment uh, as of yet. Um, there are other integrations available, such as uh, Meta Defender and Nessus scans, and we're currently using Nessus. We're deploying an agent on every uh, endpoint that we could then query with Pekafence to see if uh, the the device is in a healthy state. Um, so uh, the one last thing on there was that it being an open source, actively developed project, uh, there's, you, there's good, good and bad to that. You get the features you want quicker, you can add them if you need them, but uh, you, we did, I think it was three major version upgrades in 18 yeah. months as, as we're deploying the project to new offices, which can, can cause some instability. Finally, pain po final pain point is around roles and responsibilities. Uh, probably the biggest, and we knew this going in, the biggest challenge of this is that it touches on uh, many teams uh, This and can cause problems for any one of those teams. For an organization of any reason, uh, su substantial size, you're going to have at least five teams involved. Project management to shepherd the project, network team to configure the network gear that's going to uh, ask for the authentication, IT support that's the voice of the user, uh, bring, you know, users, what is this thing I'm seeing or not seeing? Why can't I get what I need to? IT administrators that, in our case, provision the virtual machines on which the NAC software runs, and the security team to administer the NAC application. Each one of these, what the challenge primarily is, is that each one of these could, groups could, except for the project manager, could be a, a first responder in a case of a network outage. And it, you, you've got to have some sort of, you know, workflow to triage quickly so that you can avoid finger pointing. Monitoring helps with that, but it does take a lot, because there are a lot of different actors, as you saw in those 802.1x workflow, you've got a lot of points to monitor and it's easy to lose track and, and devolve into finger pointing. Configuration management with Puppet really helped us to standardize this so we knew at least from office to office that, uh, that, that we had the same configuration. We monitored with things like Zabbix and Nag Nagios to help us know when things were wrong. It's still a challenge as we go global, but uh, the most important thing is you have to coordinate office often between teams. So I guess I would go so far as to say if you don't have a fairly decent level of collaboration and, and cooperation between the groups listed here, don't attempt to do 802.1x based network access control. Now for the part everyone's been waiting for, how to do NAC. So um, adding security by network segmentation is the easiest benefit to sell. It really helps justify the, the effort of going through this. Only uh, all of our networks uh, wired and wireless are on NAC currently. And the only thing that's not is our guest network, which uses just regular WPA2. Uh, it also leads it, or lends itself to being a good backup. If for whatever reason there's a pack offense problem, uh, users know now to, to jump on guest, get on the VPN, and they can still access all the, the, the work that they need to do. This was a big win for our incident response team and forensics teams uh, because now they, they, they can really know um, that enhanced information of if you have an uh, IP address, you can find a MAC. If you have a MAC, you can find uh, the user ID in pack offense. Um, also, uh, our network and IT support teams spend less time on individual port configurations like they used to, and users can move around at will. They can go between floors, they can go between offices, and it's all the same to them. Also, uh, bypass roles provide flexibility for our IT support team. Uh, they should be used with caution and definitely uh, cleaned up afterwards. And that goes back to your question. Another strategy for how to help the user is bypass roles are just a feature that lets the support de desk push the make it work button. And you know it bypasses all the role-based access control, but if that person can say, 
yeah, I'm supposed to get to this, then the IT support person just pull down the drop down and put them in the right place. And then, you, then theoretically, you go back later and clean that up, which we all know happens yeah. in, invariably. So uh, open source flexibility, huge part of, I mean, there's no way this would have worked without that, looking back at the project. Um, not just because we were floundering in, in, in our evaluation process, but, but because we found lots of benefits down, down the road as we implemented it. The easy availability of the software for proof of concepts and deployments means the rapidly developing and actively maintained solution. Problems are easier to diagnose because our engineers can see and understand and debug all of the problematic code in place. Uh, it is written in Perl, uh, which, which is showing its age, um, but it is interpreted code. It's really easy to hack to make it do what you want if it's busted. Um, we've had several instances of where we have, I've come up with a patch, handed it to the, to the uh, Support. support and they've put it in upstream we've had uh, in our pay for support model had our support engineer come up with code with within an hour or two to fix a specific problem and then just checks that code in for later inclusion in the mainstream product um, and we can you know you can literally get on a machine and just change the functionality of it in not in production, of course, we would never do that. Um, an example for us was when, as we mentioned earlier, where there was challenges supporting our new switching platform, we, uh, it could be added quickly, in this case, by the, the support team at the vendor. Uh, and there, the support model, I thought, was, was really good. There, there were several models. The one we chose was the time bank, which was really flexible. You just basically say, I want 40 hours of your time. Okay, that's this many thousand dollars. Uh, it sits there and you can use it for personalized uh, break fix support. You can use it for adding new features. You can use it for whatever. And in this vendor in particular, one of the big bonuses there is you could work eight, 10 hours with the, them on a pro problem. And if it turned out being a bug in their code, they would just dial back the clock and you didn't pay for that. And that, was, that's, that kept us going with that model. The uh, freemium model means that the only financial relationship you have w is, uh, is for that support, and it focuses the vendor. I mean, service after the sale is an enormous problem with security infrastructure, network infrastructure, uh, commercial products. This focuses the vendor on the service after the sale. You're, you, you get, they get renewal for performance. Um, we use screen sharing. Uh, I've never fit personally met the person who I've been working with for two years on this from the vendor. Uh, remote control, team viewer, things like that. Uh, chat, use that extensively to solve these problems in real time. So, big lesson, don't let any office chaos go to waste. Uh, some, some companies aren't positioned as fortunately as we were to be able to have that constant churn uh, in the user's environment. But in, when you're introducing NAC during a move or a renovation, it overcomes a lot of the resistance to change. People when they change physical environments, they expect there to be a certain amount of chaos, and they're not necessarily going to associate that with your project. Um, associating your project or yoking it to that schedule of office moves, it's good and bad. It's good because those tend to, they happen. I mean, they're, they're not going to be delayed for some, something in your project. You're going to be able to ride that wave except when they don't. And if you have an office and there's a planned renovation or a move and it doesn't happen, well then you've, you've got no window to introduce the technology and those users are in that network aren't protected in that way. So what about the future uh, of NAC, both at Indeed and in general? For us, it's about pervasive identity network. I, I, that's a term that I don't know if it's even current anymore, but the, the notion was just simply that all the traffic on your network has an identity that's meaningful, that you know who generated it, and you know when, and uh, you can trace it back. This does truly enable that. It's, it's probably the biggest payoff is that, that we can look at firewall logs, we can look at data in the SIM, and we can see that uh, at a certain time, a certain IP address or MAC address was associated with a certain user, which helps us know, uh, it gives a whole lot of context. Further integration with the firewall um, gives us that at the edge of, the, of each office. Uh, you can control access, uh, role-based access control at the, at the firewall to the internet. 
Um, one of the ways we're thinking of using that is having a contractor DMZ where they get dumped into that and their only way out is essentially through NAC and the firewall knows whether they VPNed in or whether they came in through a wired network what their ID is and puts a specific uh, access control for them to both the internet and the LAN. Further integration of the MAC user and IP address mapping with the incident response and forensics processes. Uh, the way we see that happening is automated enrichment of our SIM data. So as Packet Fence is seeing DHCP traffic, as it's seeing radius authentication traffic, registration uh, of MAC addresses, it's simply in real time populating the context for all that SIM data. You, know, you may have something coming in from a bro server or a firewall ending up in your SIM, and if you know that at 2.33 in the afternoon, that IP address or MAC address was this user, you just put that in that log data ahead of time. So that when there's an incident, when that uh, responder hits the SIM, they don't have to wait, they don't have to do any other searches, they just see who made, who made the problem. You know, and, and that's not to call anybody out, it's just to find a system maybe that has an infection, and you just you pick up the virtual phone, you I am somebody or Slack them and say, hey, you got to come into the IT support desk. Um, there's the hype cycle for NAC long since passed. Um, it's a, whether or not it's a dated technology, it's certainly not a you know, hyped technology. And there's a, that's for a good reason. There's a de-emphasis on secured internal office networks as the model for how people do day-to-day -day business, the mobile workforce, the mobile devices, BYOD devices software as a service or cloud-based services. It means a lot of the real work that happens uh, takes place without the mediation of the office network. My feeling is that that's kind of like what happened with firewalls, where we don't not have them because they're, they're just more of a utility now. And so this is something where it doesn't solve a lot of the newer problems, but as long as we have internal networks, uh, campus networks that have confidential data within them, this is going to be a necessary technology, at least for us. We're looking at if there's ways to intelligently tie together some of these other data sources like SAML SSO logs, uh, uh, VPN logs, uh, and other threat intelligence data, and uh, do that intelligently so that we get a maintain identity awareness across and flexible access control across these non-network, local network uh, situations. And they move against well, this, this, speaks to the, this speaks to the what I was just talking about. about it, we use, they use VPN then to get back in. Now, right. our VPN has a two-factor on it as well, so we at least then know. We know who they are. We know that they're doing two-factor. Um, you know, so that's, but that's not optimal. You know, so we'd like to have more information about that because it just dumps them into this big VPN bucket. So. Pack of Fence outages were 15 minutes to 30 minutes at a time, so... Uh, you still had the registration data. It was just um, the update. If, if someone uh, changed IP address or whatever, then that would be missing. But for the 15, 30 minutes of, we still had local data saying that this IP, this MAC address was assigned to this user. So it wasn't real time updating or anything like that. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Dale.